The war of words between two hedge fund heavyweights is heating up with Carl Icahn bashing Bill Ackman over his short position in Herbalife. Ackman does pump and dump. He's got one of the worst reputations on Wall Street. And I'm going to tell you this Herbalife is a classic example of what he does. And I'm telling you, he's like the crybaby in the schoolyard. Carl Icahn thought, you know what, this guy's roadkill on the hedge fund highway. I'm never going to have to worry about this kid again. He's not going to even have the resources to sue me. This is not an honest guy, and this is not a guy who keeps his word, and this is a guy who takes, takes advantage of little people. I mean, I wouldn't have an investment with Ackman if you paid me to do it, if Ackman paid me to do it. He's not used to someone standing up to him. I told Carl after the whole thing, he called me up, and he literally said, you know, Bill, we can be friends now. And I simply said to him, I said, look, Carl, you are no friend of mine, and, and that was it. I never said that I want to be friends with, with you, Bill. I wouldn't okay. be friends okay, with Carl. you. And okay. I would, you said okay, to Carl. me, you'd, you'd like to be friends so that we could invest together. Uh, Carl, I have no interest. Uh, do you think I want to invest with you? Okay, let's, let's move on. I would invest with you let's, if let's you were the last man on Earth. Coming up in today's show, stocks finish higher after soft retail sales, the United Kingdom and Japan slip into recession, NVIDIA now bigger than Alphabet, Supermicro hits $1,000 a share, and Bill Ackman's vindication over Carl Icahn. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Click Capital Daily Market Review. I've renamed it from the Daily Market Show to the Daily Market Review, as I thought that was a bit more of an appropriate name, as that's what I try and do here for you guys each day, is review the markets and not just tell you what's happening, but try and give you a bit of background and analysis on why it's happening and the fundamentals along with all the price action. And so that intro clip was a famous brawl broadcasted live on CNBC back in 2013 between billionaire hedge fund managers Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn, who at the time were fighting each other on a stock called Herbalife. Bill Ackman was short, Carl Icahn was long, and we just got a bit of an update on that story today and a bit of a diabolical tweet from Bill Ackman I'll share with you guys later along with my thoughts on it. First off, let's just take a bit of a bird's eye view of what's going on in markets today. Did have mega cap tech pull back a bit here today with Tesla popping up for a change over 6%. We had Wells Fargo clear regulatory hurdle, sending financials up. And those softer retail sales helped bond yields fall, which gave the yield sensitive sectors like REITs and utilities a bit of a pop. And energy, oil and gas had a good day for a bit of change of late as they've been a bit weak. There's a look at the S&P 500 closing at 50.29. And once again, it was the Russell 2000 small caps outperforming. Up another 2.6% today. We had volatility pulling back. The VIX closing smack bang on 14. And there's the pullback in yields the two year briefly getting down to 450 before bouncing off and similar price action in the 10 year yield as well closing at 4.23 percent there's a look at nvidia closing down a little bit here today we've got earnings coming out from them this coming wednesday afternoon and they have quite the expectations to meet since we've run up from below 500 dollars a share starting this year here we are trading around 730 dollars a share and so it's going to be really interesting to see how the market's going to react because no doubt they're going to beat expectations. Jensen Huang is going to do another great job getting the juices flowing. And so it could be a pivotal moment in this parabolic melt-up we've been having this year in these stocks. Could mark the blow-off top and may just be the liquidity event for a lot of big money to get out. And once again, just look at the rip in Super Micro. Just like I said a week ago, the way this thing is trading, it could hit $1,000 in the coming days. And that's exactly what we did late this afternoon in trading. Just taking you down to a five-minute chart, pretty much grinding up there all day, hit 999 and looked like it was peeling back a bit. However, it held on. And then just in the last 20 minutes of trading today, it passed 1,000. And here we are after hours climbing even further. And we're still at the back end of Q4 earnings season. It's got a bunch of key releases out now with Roku coming off hard after hours down 14%. DoorDash pulling back down 7%. And Coinbase having a big rip after hours up 15% to 191. And I had been short the common in a pairs trade against Long the Bitcoin ETF trust from BlackRock. Have a look at some of the crazy moves we've been getting in earnings lately and the tear Bitcoin's been on, I thought it was best to probably hedge the trade, which I did right before close. Buying the 200 call strikes that expire tomorrow for $2 a contract. So the way we're trading now, they're probably going to open up around $10 or so. And I may look at layering in again on the pairs trade of short Coinbase. Long the Bitcoin trust, also layered in again to one of the pairs trade I shared with you guys yesterday. Two momentum factor ETFs and also added to my bullish call spread position in meta as well and there's a look at those pair trades i shared with you guys yesterday got that wider divergence in the momentum pair hence why i added just before close and with some of the other pairs starting to snap back like the materials one it's the industrials pair just kind of stabilizing a little bit same with the multi-factor etfs and a bit of convergence in the small cap pair as well. And so before I continue with the daily show, I know a lot of you guys are new to this channel. And so I thought today I'd just give you a quick introduction to who I am, how I got to this point, and just let you know a bit about the guy behind the microphone 
bringing you these videos every day. So my name's Jared, and that's a shot of me there piping a hot one down the fairway of the fifth hole in the Lake Wanaka course, just a short drive from where I live, down in the bottom of the world in the beautiful Queenstown, New Zealand. I grew up in Australia, and after leaving school, I had a gap year or two before going on to complete a diploma of financial services. I'd already built an interest in trading and investing, and I wanted a career in this space. So in 2006, I was accepted for a job at Australia's largest investment bank, Macquarie, which is a great company, and I worked there to 2008 before discovering that corporate life is not for me. And so I resigned just before the global financial crisis and then created a software program designed for proprietary traders, small hedge funds, and financial advisors based around a trading strategy we were all doing at the time. And so I built that up over seven years and successfully exited to a larger company in London. And ever since then, I've just been doing bits and pieces, a bit of traveling, and mostly just trading and investing for myself, of which I'm a designated professional investor by my government broker in the exchanges. I have to pay a bit more in market data fees and reporting and things like that. However, it was a bit over a year ago, I was watching YouTube and some of the financial channels on there. And whilst there is some talented people on there, at least at making entertaining videos, I also found there's quite a lot of fluff. And so I'd be watching some of these videos and sometimes I'd be like, wow, did he really say that? And you look at the channel and they've got over 100, 200,000 subscribers. And I get it, a big part of YouTube is entertainment, you know, having lots of flashing objects and memes and whatever all dancing over your screen. However, I swear over half of these guys don't even trade. If they do, they only have a thousand or two thousand dollars in their account. And I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I've been trading for over 20 years. I did work in an investment bank. I've dealt plenty. I've dealt plenty with hedge funds, advisors, from all around the world. I've been around a lot of traders. And so you know that saying in the movie, Money Never Sleeps, Gordon Gecko says a fisherman can always see another fisherman from afar. Well, like I said, a lot of these YouTubers, some of the stuff they say, and I just get the feel that a lot of them don't even really trade. So that got me thinking of creating my own YouTube show where I just analyze the markets each day, share my thoughts and analysis, and use that as a platform to build a business around, where I could also share my products and services as well. And so far, so good. I've got over 5,000 subscribers. I know that's really tiny in YouTube terms compared to some of the other channels out there. However, my focus isn't on cheap entertainment, but rather trying to bring you guys content of substance, insights and analysis to what's really going on in markets. And so hopefully I can help you guys better understand financial markets, how they work and what to kind of make of them. And I don't always get it right. I'm not saying I have a 100% win rate or anything like that. All of us get it wrong, make bad trades, mistakes. That's why it's a game of numbers. The idea is to make lots of small trades with a small edge, just like a casino. And at the end of the year, hopefully you've made a good profit. And so I initially started selling my custom indicators for TradingView, which I'm happy to say are used by hundreds of people around the world every day. And I'm continually developing more and improving the existing ones that I've got. I also offer an automated stock trading bot that runs on the TradingView platform as well. And that's based on a buy the dip strategy in uptrending assets. It's fully back testable and it's showing robust profitability on the S&P 500 index going all the way back to 1900. I also share my investment research with my first presentation being released in mid-November in which I made a bullish thesis for an undervalued microcap stock, which has already climbed almost 30% since I released this presentation a couple of months ago. However, pretty much every week, someone on the channel or sending me an email would ask, do I have a course? Can I learn more about the markets and your strategies? And so I started working on making a course in July last year. And admittedly, it did take a long time because I wanted it to be comprehensive, A to Z, starting from the ground up with how markets really work, financial markets history, even things like managing and protecting your wealth, technical analysis, fundamentals, valuation, economics, then also going into details of 10 of my active trading and investing strategies, along with risk management, psychology and going over all the tools I use online. And so I just launched the course this week and I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's purchased the course. Already getting a lot of great feedback and even though I offer a seven day money back guarantee, not a single person has requested a refund so far this week after getting in and starting the course. And don't get me wrong, I know there's thousands of trading courses online, a lot of junk out there. Most of the people are just marketers and like I said, they do do a good job at making entertaining videos on YouTube. However, I'm happy to stack my course against any other course online in terms of value provided. That's why I, unlike many others, offer for a seven day money back guarantee, allowing you to watch up to half the course risk free. And so I know you're not probably looking for a course. You probably already know a lot about trading. However, I promise you'll learn a lot of valuable new knowledge and skills from my course. And so I'd like to encourage you to give it a chance. And if you don't learn anything of value, please send me an email and I'll send you your money back. No worries at all. And so if you'd like to give it a chance just for the next few days only, you can just pay the one-time fee of $199, get lifetime on-demand access, 
to watch the course. It's 12 and a half hours in total length because in a few days, I'm putting the price back to 349. I'm not sure if I'll ever sell it for this cheap again. And don't forget, you can probably claim the cost of this in your next tax return as it is an expense towards your investing. And so I promise this will be one of the best trades you take all year. It's risk-free upside. And if you're interested in taking me up on this offer, then head on over to my website, clickcapital.io forward slash course. Then you'll come to this page here. You just want to enter your email address, click on the blue button. You'll come to the checkout page. You just want to click on apply coupon up here. Enter and save 150. Click on apply. Then you'll just pay $199 one time fee. And you can check out safely with your credit card or PayPal account. Keep the page open and you'll be redirected to create an account and password and you can start the course right away. And this is something I plan on updating for many more years to come. I want to make it the best course online. It's something I eventually want to share with my kids and just help them understand financial markets and how to grow and protect your wealth in them. Because I think that's one of the biggest things a lot of schools and the curriculums around the world don't teach us is financial education. How many of us got taught markets, investing, tax, saving, personal finance, all these things in school. We don't get taught. And so that's part of the reason why I created this course as well. Wanted to share my knowledge. And so in there, I've got a lot of stuff that I've never talked about on this show that I'm sure you'll find a lot of value in. So if you're interested in learning more about that and getting access today, go to clickcapital.io or click the link below this video and give it a chance for yourself. All right, diving back into the daily review. We got retail sales coming today, falling a bit more than expected. Economists were expecting a 0.3% fall, actually came in at 0.8%. And December's retail sales were actually revised down to show a 0.4% gain. We also got weekly jobless claims coming at 212,000, showing the labor market still holding up pretty good as that was down from 220,000 people claiming unemployment benefits last week. And so it's no surprise Treasury yields fell lower after we got that economic data. Kind of really helps the picture out here for the Fed and the market overall as we have been getting some signs of things heating up out there. So this is kind of like a neutral sign for the market. And it looks like those global inverted bond yields we were looking at last year were right after all. We've got the world's sixth largest economy, the United Kingdom, technically falling into a recession. After we got their GDP numbers yesterday, showing the economy shrunk by a larger than expected 0.3% between October and December, after it already contracted between July and September. So the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of contracting GDP. So you could think of GDP, gross domestic product, kind of like the sales of a country. And when it contracts for six months in a row, it's said to be in a recession. We just got the same thing from the world's third largest economy, Japan. And I like how these articles say unexpectedly slips into recession. Well, if you were looking at the inverted bond yield curves, it was actually expected. Their GDP contracted by worse than expected 0.4% in the last three months. And that was after it shrank by a huge 3.3%. So not big dips. There still are technical recessions. Could still go deeper. But just shows that global economic growth isn't all it's cracked up to be. But we've already known that for a while. Just looking at the spread of the growth commodity copper versus the flight to safety commodity gold that's been in a downtrend for a couple of years now no doubt exacerbated from china which has been in a bear market for three full years now and in that time their economy contracting from seven eight percent annual growth rates down to five percent so it's been a bit of a repricing there however their economy is still growing and the government's really trying to get underneath their markets here and put a bottom in it however that doesn't matter yet for american tech companies all they got to do is mention ai on their earnings call and things will start ripping with the mentioning of artificial intelligence hitting a record high and fourth quarter earnings calls 36% of companies mentioned AI. And there's a look at the chart of those mentions of AI. Just a few years back, we were sitting around 10%. Here we are at 36%. We can see the same thing in Google Trends. The amount of people searching for AI stocks. Currently at record highs, the highest it's been over the last 10 years. Same for NVIDIA's stock code. Currently at highs. Super microcomputer going off the charts. Not to mention the number of news articles mentioning the term soft landing, implying no recession. Actually getting to similar peaks we saw back in late 1999 before the Nasdaq crashed 80% and we did get a recession. Similar deal in 2006 for the global financial crisis. However, according to a lot of people, this time's different because AI is amazing. That's why we've got the biggest AI company in the world, NVIDIA, selling the hardware that AI runs on top of, just overtaking Alphabet to become the third most valuable company in the States. Even though they've got trailing 12-month revenue of about $43 billion versus Alphabet's $307 billion. Even though NVIDIA's profit margin's only modestly higher at the moment, around 45%, around Alphabet's typical 25% range. And probably the most crazy stock so far this year in the run-up, Supermicrocomputer, basically just sell the server racks 
AI chips sit on top of, and Bank of America is jumping on board, saying they believe the market for AI servers is much larger than is factored in street models. They've got a price target of 1040 which is probably going to hit tomorrow by the looks of it. If not this afternoon as I speak, we're currently trading at 1028 and look at that run up in the daily. Just an absolute parabolic move, and what's even more impressive is the volumes. 25 million shares today, volumes exploding, even though the stock price is exploding. And even though it's got a market cap around 50 billion, just a fraction of the others, once again, came in number two today. It's the most traded stock, just under $25 billion worth of stock. It's up there with Nvidia, Tesla, and Apple. And it's just broken out once again. In terms of options volume, coming in number two today at 1.47 billion in call options traded. That's more than S&P 500 at 886 million. So just a crazy amount of activity, participation, volume. And Thursday's not typically a busy day in the market unless we get a big economic data and the overall market has a really big move, which we didn't really get today. Options market still clocked up, 46.1 million contracts traded, massively lopsided, 60% calls, and 62% of the options going to expire in the next five days. In other words, a lot of people are banking on the stock market and all these hot stocks to keep ripping higher into next week. And with this concentrated tech trade, we've now got the share of the top five companies by market cap in the S&P 500, approaching those record levels from the late 60s and early 70s. With a few of you on this channel possibly remembering that time, what they called the Nifty 50, similar theme today. A bunch of stocks back then really dominating the headlines and dominating the market. Things like IBM, AT&T, Exxon, Eastman Kodak, General Motors. And those five stocks as well got up to 25%. However, it was 20 years later, the concentration of the top five stocks actually fell to a bit above 10%. However, this time's different, right? Because of AI. Well, when looking at data, especially over the long run, looking at longer than three years, five years annualized returns, starting valuations are attributable to over 80% of the long-term returns going forward. So looking at forward price to earnings on the S&P 500 and the subsequent one-year returns, there's a lot more dispersion in the scatter plot just looking at one year because in the short term, things are quite chaotic, almost random. Have a look at the narrowing of the scatter plot for subsequent five-year annualized returns against the starting forward PE. So, so on the x-axis down the bottom here, We've got the forward PE levels. Then on the Y axis on the left here, we've got the subsequent five year annualized returns. So you can see quite a strong correlation between low forward PEs and then higher subsequent average yearly returns. And so here we are now, forward PE, a bit over 20 on the S&P 500. Looking back in history, that correlates with forward five year returns, somewhere around the 5% mark. And the higher we go, the lower those returns will get. And once we go above 22, Looking back in history, every single five-year subsequent period resulted in negative annual returns. And like I said, a lot of people haven't lived through a real bear market like we saw back in the early 2000s after the tech bubble popped back then. And so for the last 20 years, it's been a pretty easy trade. And we're ripped up like crazy on the NASDAQ. And this market just continues to lure more and more people in. And who knows how much higher it can go before we do get that inevitable blow off top and pop. And unfortunately, like happens every time, a lot of people will lose their shirt in it because they're too overexposed and concentrated and don't really understand the importance of diversification. And just moving on to an interesting piece I thought I'd share with you guys today, going back to the intro of this video, the fight between the billionaire hedge fund managers Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn. It was over Herbalife, which Bill Ackman was accusing of being a pyramid scheme, which I agree with. They prey on vulnerable people in vulnerable communities, just send them some garbage, nutrition supplement products, sign up as a distributor and try and flog it off to their family and friends, stuff like that. And so Bill was short the stock and was making public presentations like he used to do on shorts. And him and Carl Icahn had already had history where they'd partner up. Carl did the dirty on him, didn't pay him, Bill took him to court and won. And then so Carl was trying to come back and get him back by incentivizing the market to short squeeze Bill, which he actually ended up doing pretty good. Got Bill to cough it up. Lost over a billion dollars in his fund. Loss of confidence, loss of investors. Carl Icahn actually banked a billion dollars. And that was actually after that, Bill said he's no longer going to short stocks or at least go public with his short positions. And so this was in 2012. And the trade initially started working for Bill. However, once Carl Icahn got on it, it actually did rip up forced build to cover. Then it kind of just potted along sideways for a few years, went a little bit higher. In the last couple of years, it's significantly underperformed, even more so today, down 31%. There's a look at the daily chart after they reported earnings on a big miss. And it's amazing this business is still alive. Even though it's small now, probably down to 650 million market cap or so. Bill, one of the most vocal hedge fund managers there are, probably the number one. If you want an interesting follow on X, I recommend following Bill Ackman. He is pretty vocal and always speaks his mind. And so today he came out with a scathing 
review on this situation, saying it's a very good day for my psychological short in Herbalife, and it is even a better day for the world to see one of the biggest pyramid schemes fail. So it's sad that so many with so little have been deceived and bankrupted by Herbalife. It's incredibly disappointing that the FTC in 2016 chose to settle with Herbalife for 200 million and allow it to continue to operate. The FTC knew Herbalife was a pyramid scheme, and he even goes on to tag FTC, even tagged Camilla Harris as the Attorney General of the State of California, saying she had the opportunity to shut down Herbalife, but didn't, saying the FTC's failure to act made Carl Icahn a billion dollars and cost Pershing Square investors a billion dollars. Then finishing up by saying, if you're a Herbalife employee, the time to leave is now. And then signing off by addressing the CEO of Herbalife, Michael Johnson, and the Herbalife management team. Shame on you for the incredible harm you've caused and the lives you have destroyed. And so it's quite the vindication for Bill. Turns out he was right in the end. But like the old saying, being early is the same as being wrong. And I think people just ganged up on him because they didn't want to see the privileged billionaire hedge fund manager make money off it by coming and telling everyone it was a pyramid scheme, even though we all really knew that they were. And it's interesting to see Carl Icahn actually won at that time and felt pretty good about it, forcing Bill Ackman to get out, take a huge loss. But turns out, in the end, he was actually right about the whole thing all along. Not only that, but Pershing Square, Bill Ackman's hedge fund, actually has almost 20 billion assets under management now, while Carl Icahn's listed company, Icahn Enterprises, only has a market cap of 8.6 billion now, finishing his career now in his 80s at the lows. He's been a huge underperformer over the last 10 years. And was back on this big red candle here. Bill Ackman took another swipe at Icahn as well, accusing him of all the shady business practices he engages in. So I thought that was a bit of an interesting story for you guys on the fights billionaires have. Makes for great entertainment, doesn't it? Just moving on with the show, even though we got that weaker than expected retail sales data today and the fall in bond yields, Fed fund futures still pricing in the Fed to stay on hold until June, so given an 80% chance of cutting then. And why not, says the stock market, back into extreme greed territory at 76. Let's look at the dollar index, pulling back a little bit there today. Still on a well-defined short-term uptrend here. So look at Bitcoin, looking a little technically exhausted in the short term at least. These new Bitcoin ETFs are attracting a lot of new investors into them, it's helping driving up the underlying so they've had to buy a lot more coins than have been mined on a daily basis. Seeing the aggregate flows into these ETFs lately be doing over half a billion a day. And there's a look at the biggest of them all, the BlackRock iShares Bitcoin Trust, now over 5 billion assets under management. And it was today, it just took out by a few ticks the highs it made on the first day of trading a bit over a month ago. There's a look at crude holding ground just above 77.50 a barrel. Gold trying to hold $2,000 an ounce. Got a bit of a bounce in Chinese and clean energy today. International stock indices all finishing Thursday up higher as well. A little bit of a bounce back in the cannabis ETF and make a cap tech all having a bit of a pullback today except Meta looking pretty technically strong here. Why I'm staying long but with a tight stop. Let's look at super micro computer after hours as I speak trading 1030. Got options expiry tomorrow third Friday of the month and what I'll be looking for and what you see quite often in melt ups like this and what usually marks the top is a big crazy doji candle something like this. It'll kind of gap up trade higher go down and then maybe pull up a bit and it'll make a big ridiculous candle like this. Then typically what you see is that first huge sell down day like crazy, but a lot of big money bails and a lot of people think by the dip, it normally will trace back up sometimes around halfway of that move down and then it might consolidate for a little bit before rolling down. And it's this level here that confirms it's over. Once it kind of pops up, makes a big spinning doji, that initial big down day or two, little retrace and bounce, maybe you can come and retest up to this candle, then she'll fall over again. And once we take out that low, then usually what we see is consolidation or a downtrend after that. And then that will give clues to the sediment in the market because this is the hottest thing right now. And that's what we've got to keep an eye on. Same deal with arm holdings. However, that's already slowed down a bit, trading well off those highs above 160 we saw on Monday. And meme stocks as a whole ripping up pretty good here today. A lot of volatility and volume in the space. Lyft having another good day. Just got earnings from DraftKings. They're down a little bit after hours. And some stocks have just gone parabolic as well. Cybersecurity, CrowdStrike, Vertiv, even the restaurant chain Wingstop. It's been an absolute parabolic tear this last couple of months. Along with clothing retailer, Abercrombie and & Fitch, and a big move up in Wells Fargo today. They got cleared of a regulatory hurdle relating to complaints of the 2016 fake account scandals in which they apparently were opening a lot of fake accounts to juice their numbers. Market really loved that. Also sending other financials ripping higher today. Once again, JP Morgan doing the best breaking out to fresh highs. All right, guys, there we have an S&P 
closing over 5,000 again. Could come up and test those all-time highs at 50.48 tomorrow. It is OPEX. Could get interesting. Animal spirits are well and alive in the market. Still on this parabolic grind, which we could stay in as long as we stay above the 50-day VWAP. Market's still in an uptrend. And we can see that looking at my sector trends table indicator. Earlier in the week, we went into a quick short-term pullback, but now it's pretty much green across the board. Except gold miners, bit of weakness and clean energy utilities in the medium long term. Everything else is pretty much above its immediate, short, medium, and long-term moving averages. So like the old saying goes, don't fight the trend, and who knows how high and crazy we can go. Just gotta keep those tight trailing stops. For when it inevitably tops and rolls over, we wanna get out before the carnage hits. And that's a wrap for the Daily Markets Review today. Thank you very much for tuning in, and I appreciate all you guys who hit the like button and drop a comment, I reply to you all. So please share your thoughts on this market and what's happening. Always interested to hear from you guys. And like I said, if you wanna further your education and understanding of financial markets, and I'd encourage you to give my online course a chance. And like I said, you can watch up to half of it risk-free. For the one-time fee of $199, it's lifetime on-demand access. And that's only available for a few more days. So click the link below this video to learn more about this special offer. Otherwise, I'll see all you guys tomorrow night. Cheers.